So my name is Felicia, as you have all heard, and it is a great honor for me to be here as part of this illustrious lecture series. Um, one of the things that I do is I'm the editor-in-chief of LA Yoga, Ayurveda, and Health magazine. And I did bring some magazines um, for everyone here today, if you would like to take some with you. And in our current issue, we pay tribute to BKS Iyengar, who passed away recently, and whose life and work is extremely relevant to the topic of this talk, which is yoga and Ayurveda in the world today, particularly the Western world and particularly Southern California, because this is where we are right now. When we think about many pioneers, many people who have come to the West and brought and disseminated the teachings of yoga and Ayurveda, I think BKS Iyengar is one person who has made a great impact on both of these sciences as we know them, not only in Southern California, but around the world. Now I know that tomorrow is um, Vivekananda's birthday, and Vivekananda is another great figure, um, honored here at this temple and an important, um, an important teacher whose influence is still felt, I think, on a daily basis in terms of the teachings of yoga and Ayurveda. Even though he did not necessarily speak directly about Ayurveda, it was woven into everything that he spoke and lectured about and in his emphasis on Dharma and on teaching. I know in my life I have been very much influenced by both of these sciences, by both of these sacred traditions, and I think I'm an example of somebody who comes from a purely Western background. I am, my ethnic background is mixed European. I grew up in a small town in New England, a small town in Connecticut of 15,000 people. I was born in the early 70s. So I grew up in a time and a place where yoga was not so prevalent. But now when I go back, you know, for instance, I was back in my hometown over the holidays, and there are several yoga centers in the main area of this small New England town that, you know, a decade ago were not there, that 20 years ago, that 40 years ago were not there. My first influence, you know, of these teachings came in high school English class when we read the writings of Emerson and Thoreau, who were famously influenced by the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and many of the sacred texts and writings from India. And, you know, we're also influenced, you know, by many of these teachers. Their writings influenced Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. and were also influenced directly by the texts. We know that Gandhi was directly influenced by the texts. We know that Martin Luther King Jr., you know, also very timely in terms of this being January and Martin Luther King Day coming up in terms of a film in his honor that is currently being released. And there are scenes in that film where you see Martin Luther King Jr. with a statue of Gandhi on his desk or a picture of Gandhi in his office or in his room. And I think we see over these decades, over the past, um, you know, since Vivekananda came to this country and before, the influence of these teachings and these sacred sciences on Western culture. And, and again, I feel like in many ways, I am an example of that, someone who took to these teachings that were very different than, than my own life or kind of my life of um, hot dogs and kind of the typical American pursuits. And, you know, when I first became a vegetarian after doing more reading into yoga and Ayurveda, my parents were very puzzled. And, you know, even the practice of yoga puzzled them to the point where now my mother actually attends a chair yoga class at, you know, one of the places where, where, um, where she frequents. And um, when we think about the influence of these teachings in modern culture and in culture beyond Artesia, beyond Norwalk, beyond a temple such as this. They have had a great impact 
you know, on, on life today. And that's one of the things I'll be speaking about. In addition to my work at LA Yoga, Ayurveda, and Health Magazine, um, I'm very involved with the Ayurveda community. I first began studying Ayurveda about 22 years ago. I had read a book by an author whose name many of us may have heard by Deepak Chopra. I read Perfect Health. And his is a name that, again, a very sort of Western perspective on the teachings, but someone who has made great inroads and created great influence of these teachings so that many more people have heard of them than might have been done otherwise. After I read that book, I found a flyer at the place where I was going to university. I went to university at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And in a small health food store, there was a flyer for an introduction to Ayurveda class that was being taught by a student of Baba Haridas, you know, who um, is the founder of Mount Madonna Center in Northern California. And he was somebody, or he is somebody, that has been promoting not only the teachings of yoga in terms of yoga asana and the teachings of yoga in terms of yoga philosophy, but also the teachings of Ayurveda, bringing um, numerous Ayurvedic um, vaijas and physicians from India so that his Western students could study directly with teachers from India. And so again, you know, my life and my work has been influenced by that, by someone bringing by an Indian guru, by an Indian teacher bringing vaijas from India to the West to teach Westerners. So we see so many examples of this that continue to the current day. So my first teacher was a student um, in that lineage, in that tradition, and that's where predominantly I learned the practice of yoga and the study of philosophy is um, in that setting and in that tradition and lineage. And I fell in love with the practice of Ayurveda. You know, something that, you know, for some people was a tradition that they grew up with or may have been a tradition that was a little bit more of sort of grandmother's wisdom than something to be honored in the way that it is becoming more honored today. So I took one class in Ayurveda and then another and then another and another and at the time, as I mentioned, I was a university student and I was studying, um, partly influenced by my interest in yoga and Ayurveda, I was studying anthropology and then environmental sciences and I was studying plants because I loved and fell greatly in love with the tradition of the use of medicinal plants in Ayurveda and the use of medicinal plants around the world and had a great love of that and wanted to combine my academic studies with my, you know, how I had fallen in love with yoga and Ayurveda. And to continue that, I went and got a second degree. I got a degree in nursing. And I'm, to this day, a registered nurse in the state of California. And the reason why I wanted to study nursing is I had continued in the practice and the study of Ayurveda. And this was 20 years ago, where it was much less prevalent than it is today. And many of my colleagues, or many of my teachers even, were people who had fallen in love with Ayurveda and studied this and practiced it and had these sort of side practices like an herbalist or a midwife and um, a healer and would see people and what I wanted was something a little bit more which also is relevant to what brings us here today which is to be able to integrate the teachings of yoga and Ayurveda into the practice of Western medicine and into mainstream medicine. And over the past 20 years that I have been involved with these sciences and these teachings, I have seen many of my colleagues in Western medicine embrace the practice of yoga and Ayurveda or the practices of yoga and Ayurveda. Within the Ayurvedic community, there are many people, whether they are nurses or nurse practitioners or physicians or chiropractors, who, in addition to their study of Western medicine, have embarked on courses of study in yoga and or Ayurveda to be able to add that piece to what they do or to provide that understanding. Even when I did my yoga teacher training, there was another um, woman in the training who was a medical doctor or urologist who found that 
the practice of yoga helped many of her patients with conditions like interstitial cystitis, you know, something that is a significant inflammatory condition with a great deal of pain, that if they practiced yoga and used the breath in specific ways, they could relieve some of that pain and some of that discomfort and have better treatment outcomes. And this is something that over the past 20 years, over the past decades, we have seen again and again. You know, even Bikas Angar, a large part of his life's work that he has passed on to his family and to his students is the therapeutic application of yoga, right? That we know that yoga is a path to self-realization, but it is also a path to feeling better and to greater holistic health and wellness. And we know that Ayurveda as a medical system is that medical system that explains and describes how we can actually live a life of greater health and how not only we can live a life of greater health, but through that greater health, we can then do a better job dedicating ourselves to self-realization. Right? It can sometimes be distracting to not feel well, right? Which is why in Ayurveda there is that emphasis placed on how do we find a state of balance in order to then dedicate ourselves more fully to our family, to our dharma, to our own practice of self-realization. And it's something that when I think about my own life and I think about watching yoga and Ayurveda over these past 20 years, which has been a large part of my professional life, I have seen a lot, you know, a great deal, you know, exponential increase in the embrace of Western society for the practices of yoga and Ayurveda. And we can think about it in terms of, you know, yoga and philosophy and the social change work that was begun with Emerson and Thoreau and continued with Martin Luther King Jr. and beyond. We can think about it in the use of traditional Ayurvedic remedies on a daily basis to the point that the last issue of Vogue magazine, you know, a very Western magazine if there ever were one, had uh, uh, something in the front of the magazine on turmeric and the incredible healing potential of turmeric. And many of us in this room do not need magazine articles to tell us of the incredible healing power of turmeric, is that right? And one of the things, you know, traditionally in Ayurveda, medicinal plants are understood, you know, oftentimes if we combine them in specific ways, their medicinal properties, you know, there's, there's synergistic properties that combining different herbs and plants have. And black pepper, the piperine in black pepper, is understood within the teachings of Ayurveda, within the textual tradition, to enhance the bioavailability of the anti-inflammatory compounds of turmeric, right, of the curcumin and the different things. And an Ayurvedic practitioner, traditionally trained, um, or even myself, you know, as a Westerner trained by numerous um, teachers over the past 20 some odd years, I wouldn't dream of utilizing turmeric without black pepper. And in this article, it spoke about how using black pepper with turmeric enhanced the bioavailability and allowed it to be more effective as an anti-inflammatory agent. And if you go to you know, Whole Foods or Sprouts and look through the supplements that contain turmeric, many of them, you know, there are many companies that are starting to include this type of wisdom in the way that they formulate their products, you know, so that they are including things like black pepper along with the turmeric, or they are combining herbs in ways that would be done also in the teachings of Ayurveda. And I think, again, we can see these as examples of, you know, how the tradition is being used well and embraced in a modern perspective. Of course, there are challenges along with any gifts, but, but I, I admit I was kind of surprised to see even in, in Vogue magazine we see this, this embrace of a particular teaching. And again, this is an example of it. And one of the things that I think happens in Western culture that we see particularly in 
you know, modern Western biomedicine is this great love of research, right? And so we have also seen over the past decades an increase in research studies related to the practice of yoga. You know, the person I mentioned, my colleague in my teacher training, you know, did research with some of her patients, you know, in the particular use of yoga therapeutically. Um, and we have seen over the years people like Dr. Dean Ornish, who was a student of Swami Satchidananda. And Swami Satchidananda influenced his work and his research. So we see the influence of great teachers throughout the decades. You know, and Dean Ornish's work is held up as a great example of a pioneer who demonstrated how yoga applied therapeutically, and not simply yoga asana, but meditation, but the use of food, but the use of even community, how people come together in community. You know, what the Buddhists call the Sangha, or you know, what, how we come together in whatever form, how all of these things have the potential to be strongly healing, and the importance of that in terms of the way it is practiced today. So we see this increase, this surge of research studies related to yoga and Ayurveda. And I think those have also contributed to the proliferation of both of these teachings and practices. And on one hand, we could say, well, why are these research studies necessary? We know that these practices are effective, and we know that these practices work. And I would also say that the really deep traditions of yoga and Ayurveda in and of themselves are scientific, right? What is the scientific method but a very calculated series of observations and noticing the effects and then repeating what works, right? We repeat what works, or at least we hope we repeat what works. And so the confirmation of this is important. And I think it is something that has helped legitimatize in many eyes the practices of yoga and Ayurveda. And, and I, for one, have found it helpful to be able to state, you know, there is some research or there is some, something to, to back it up. Because we do live, you know, in the Western world within certain systems and structures. And how do we bring in the practice of Ayurveda and yoga to these systems and structures? And I'll get back to that in a moment. But um, in terms of the research, it's something that is very strong or has become more strong in the yoga community, particularly the community of yoga therapeutics. And there are organizations in the U.S that have become very active over the past um, couple of decades. The International Association of Yoga Therapists is one. And it's a group of mixed Westerners and Indians, a group of people from many different backgrounds. Some of them are Western-trained healthcare providers. Some of them are very traditionally trained yoga teachers or yoga therapists. And with the whole aim of bringing forth the teaching and practice of yoga in such a way that is accessible to people who would like to be able to have access to these practices for their health and healing. That we see the efficacy of them in so many situations and everything from back pain to heart conditions to helping deal with many of the side effects and issues that come up if somebody is going through cancer treatment to helping to improve sleep. I could go on for the rest of our time together giving examples, but again, they're examples that you already know and understand and, and believe, those of you here, and especially those of you here who are proliferating, proliferating the practice of yoga in this room and training teachers here in this space. The International Association of Yoga Therapists has annual conferences, and they have annual conferences where they bring together teachers and practitioners and students, and they have conferences where they also bring together people engaged in research, in research of all kinds related to the practice of yoga therapy. And they are having, um, in 2015, it's interesting because some of the prominent organizations in this field, both the International Association of Yoga Therapists 
and the National Ayurvedic Medical Association are having their large annual conferences in Southern California. So we are seeing, you know, and, and I know that there is an upcoming yoga conference that is happening here in this space. So we see the gathering together of people at greater, more professional levels bringing, bringing these teachings. And I, I think it's significant that it is also happening in Southern California. I just mentioned the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. So that's an organization that brings together, again, people from different backgrounds. Um, Ayurvedic practitioners and physicians and vajas trained in India. People who have trained in the U.S. either in formal programs or in more informal gurukula or mentorship type programs. Students and teachers and brings them together in an association. And the 12th annual National Ayurvedic Medical Association Conference is happening in April in Southern California. So it is also a bringing together of people in Southern California, which I think is interesting for those of us who live here. Personally, I've been on the board of directors of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association for nine years. It has been part of my seva, part of my way to give back to help promote these sciences and help answer some of the questions of how do we integrate a little bit more into modern medicine? What are some of the challenges? I think research studies or even press or hearing about these things is, is one way that we do. It's one way that it grows of all the people who will read about turmeric and become curious about something more than simply turmeric or people who will read about um, any number of other remedies, it becomes interesting. You know, one of the other research studies that um, came out in the last couple of years that I found interesting and, and sort of provocative is in um, Western medicine, one of the screening tests that it's recommended that people start doing, you know, somewhere around the age of 50 or beyond is a colonoscopy, right? And so there's a sort of preparation that goes along with colonoscopy, you know, if you receive the prescription from your Western doctor and it's to drink, um, to drink a fluid, it's to fast for a certain amount of time. Well, there is a traditional practice in yoga and Ayurveda of varisardhati, right, which is the flushing of the GI system, particularly of the um, of the colon and of the intestines, and it's a practice that utilizes salt water and specific asana, right? And you would do this, you know, as a as a um, as a practice, right? As a detoxification practice, as a cleansing practice. Well, there was a study that compared the Western biomedical um, colonoscopy preparation with varisardhati to see which one was actually more effective if you are, you know, if you have to do a colonoscopy, right? And it found that doing varisardhati was more effective and, and also a little bit easier on the body. That some of the, um, some of the liquid preparation that is used in Western biomedicine, go, it's called go lightly, and it has some things in it that you may or may not, may or may not be top of your list of what you would actually like to drink. So... But I found that interesting and also provocative in the way that let's look at some of these questions and look at some of these remedies and treatments and practices and actually look at how they can be utilized in the world today. Because I think one of the challenges that can, can, can come up when we consider the modern practice of yoga and Ayurveda is sometimes people may feel it comes from a different time or a different place, or it may feel very foreign. And I think sometimes the strength of Ayurveda is in its venerable ancient age, but sometimes that can be seen as a drawback. <gasps> Bless you. And sometimes people can feel that the use of Sanskrit terms could be confusing or foreign, but when we also know that there are some Sanskrit terms that cannot be directly translated into English so that they must stay intact. But when we look at, and I look at this again in the sort of frame or the lens of my own lifetime, someone who is kind of an unlikely student of yoga and Ayurveda, 
and we look at you know how much the English language has changed as a result of the use of Sanskrit terms, whether or not they are fully understood when they are used in a Western context. But there is still the proliferation of them. There is still the use of them. When we see how images around yoga have infiltrated modern Western advertising, maybe even if they are just seen from the surface, maybe even if they are just kind of scanned over or they are the parts of yoga that seem to be on the surface, they are still there. So there is a greater familiarity. And I think even the greater familiarity of Westerners with the asana practice leads inevitably to a greater familiarity with some of the other practices of yoga. You know, one must start somewhere. And the place we often start is with the body. And I fully believe that a person who practices yoga in any form, that yoga must change them in some way. Right? Sometimes we talk about you know, how yoga has become corrupted by different versions or different forms of it. But I am of the belief that yoga itself is incorruptible. Right? Ayurveda itself is incorruptible. That these teachings are beyond us. Yes, there are times when people who can be corruptible, we would all agree upon that part of it, as in our imperfection, maybe we are not necessarily always showing something in its best light, but that yoga itself is something that exists beyond all of us in this room or all of us living on the planet in the world today. But I think the great gift is that if we really consider it, there are more people in the world today who practice yoga than has happened at any other time in history. Right? If we really think about that, there are more people in the world today that have practiced yoga than have happened at any other time of history. And I think the same is true of Ayurveda. Even though Ayurveda in the West and in this country is much less known than yoga, and even not as well known as, say, acupuncture or different forms of Chinese medicine, right? Ayurveda is still a little bit mysterious to people. But what I have seen is we have, you know, Ayurvedic physicians who are speaking on Dr. Oz's show, right, who is watched by millions. We see, or what I have seen is a greater proliferation of Ayurveda classes being taught at yoga studios, right? Just at yoga studios, you will see classes in Introduction to Ayurveda. You see, you know, I um, produce LA Yoga Ayurveda and Health magazine. We've been publishing for 13 years. The largest yoga magazine in the world today is Yoga Journal, and they've been publishing for over 40 years and have a very large mainstream following. And they regularly cover components or topics related to Ayurveda that they are introducing people who have not heard the term before or are not familiar with it. So we see the inroads of this. One of the things that I do that I've done for several years is I teach at a professional plant-based culinary school. I teach professional chefs. And I teach them the components of Ayurveda, different medicinal properties of Ayurveda when it comes to food. Now this is sort of a unique professional school in that it is a plant-based cooking school where they focus on vegetarian and vegan and training professional chefs who do not wish to spend most of their time learning different cuts of meat and how to cook them. And there are a couple of these schools throughout the country. This is another trend that we see that is a little bit different than the community of, say, yoga and Ayurveda. But when we consider you know, different trends that are happening in the Western world today, we see the inclusion of Ayurveda as healing cuisine that is being taught to people who wish to make this their profession. And it's not something that you would have seen 20 years ago to you know, such great visibility the way it is today. Even the teaching of Ayurveda in this country. You know, there was a point in time where most of the people practicing Ayurveda in the West were vajas or were physicians who came from India. 
and they would start to train some students. And some of those students would be healthcare providers. You know, for example, um, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, you know, very famously brought Indian Vijas to the US and had them train medical doctors, nurses, chiropractors. And so many of the early adopters in the West of um, Ayurveda in the healthcare community were people who practiced transcendental meditation and then started incorporating principles of Ayurveda into their practice. And then you started to see other waves would, where there was more training of students. You know, even some of my teachers who were trained by Indian teachers. One of my long-term teachers is a British medical doctor who was a longtime student of Dr. Fasant Laud, who runs the Ayurvedic Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Another person who has come to the West and had a strong influence on the proliferation of yoga and Ayurveda in this country. And now, over the past decade or so, you see more formalized Ayurvedic programs being created. In Northern California, Mount Madonna Center now has a full-on Ayurvedic practitioner certification program. They bring in teachers from around the world. Um, it's somewhere I, where I've done some of my continuing education with one of my teachers, who's a physician from Nepal. And they have partnered you know, to bring in even a master's degree program. The California College of Ayurveda has full-on certification and practitioner programs and also the ability for their students to earn a master's degree. Here in Whittier, you know, so not that far down the street, the Southern California University of Health Sciences, which is a uh, school of chiropractic and acupuncture, over the past couple of years has added to their programs um, two different Ayurvedic certifications program, a wellness practitioner as well as an Ayurvedic practitioner, where they are training students and their classes are filling up. The, um, American University of Complementary Medicine in Los Angeles offers a clinical PhD program for their students in the practice of Ayurveda. So we're starting to see you know, more um, at a university level or a master's degree level, more of the teaching of Ayurveda. At Loyola Marymount University in Westchester over near LAX, they have had for almost 10 years now a yoga therapy program that's held at the university where it's a certification program and they started out with one year and then two years and then three years and now four years including their students have the ability to participate in a clinical internship at the Venice Family Clinic which you know demonstrates or is an example of this more fuller integration of you know, specifically in this case, yoga therapy, within an integrative setting, within a setting that is a clinic that is predominantly a Western medical clinic with a very holistic bent or an integrative medicine bent to it. And that's something that last year was the first year they had students in their clinic. Again, I think demonstrating the growth of this. You know, Loyal and Marymount also had increased the amount of Ayurveda that they have been teaching to the students in the yoga therapy program and beyond. You know, this year, Loyola Marymount University also added a fully um, accredited master's degree program in yoga philosophy. So another example that we see of how these teachings have become more integrated, you know, not just the teaching of asana, but full on the teaching of philosophy, the teaching of Sanskrit, the bringing of students to India, and, and how this is becoming part of the fabric of the Western world today. In uh, Maryland, you know, this is apart from Southern California, but there's another university in Maryland similar to the Southern California University of Health Sciences or Lloyd La Marymount University, where they are offering a master's degree program in yoga therapy. So we see more universities offering this type of area of study, which again demonstrates, you know, how it's being brought into the world. So I brought with me a couple of things. I, as I mentioned, I brought current copies of LA Yoga Magazine. I also brought, there's a basket in the back, and please help yourselves, some Tulsi tea. 
And um, there's some different varieties in there. There's plain Tulsi, and then there's Tulsi mixed with other medicinal herbs. And it's from a company called Organic India. And they advertise with us in the magazine. We have a long-term partnership with them. They also support um, Ayurveda in this country. They are great supporters of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. They support at the California College of Ayurveda um, medicinal herb demonstration garden. You know, so they've granted and gifted the university or the college um, with funds and with seeds to do that, you know, to, to start to plant more medicinal medicinal plants, medicinal herbs that are used in Ayurveda in California, which again I think is is a great sign of, you know, how um, how we can look at these practices in a modern in a modern light. Well, I traveled to India this past fall with the team from Organic India. They go every year to visit, you know, it's an Indian company, they have a US sales team, and they work with a collective or a um, cooperative of farmers who are all using organic biodynamic techniques. And, you know, we went to Lucknow and Azamgar where the farms were, and then we made a pilgrimage to Varanasi where we you know, we're at the, on the Ganga at sunrise. Um, but again, one of the things that struck me is this connection between, you know, ancient traditional practices in India. They work with Vijas to make formulas. They look at what are different medicinal herbs and how can they be used. And then how can farmers be supported with integrity? How can organic and biodynamic farming practices be sustainable, and then how those products can be shipped and purchased around the world so that we then also have access to Tulsi, which is a great medicinal, you know, it's a great devotional herb, but it is also beloved in Ayurveda because it is an adaptogen, because it helps to strengthen the adrenals and the nervous system because it um, helps to bring down a fever, it's good for the lungs, you know, there's many things that uh, Tulsi is good for, and it is the kind of thing that you could drink every day. So when we look at, you know, some of the positive things that are happening in the world today, we see, we can see many examples. Um, I just wanted to check on my time. Okay, so a couple minutes and we open up to questions and answers, right? So I've given you just kind of a little bit of context and sort of history, and I am a bit of an optimist, I admit, right? So I've, you know, I've talked about some of the positive things that have happened. There are definitely challenges, and I've touched on some of those as well, that sometimes there can be a bit of a language barrier to bringing these teachings into, you know, how they can be more integrated into Western, you know, modern Western biomedicine. But I do think that Again, when we see, you know, how plants are used in traditional ways or how remedies are used in traditional ways and how they can be incorporated, it is something that there is a great deal of interest in and I think that inroads can be continued to be made. Another organization I've been involved with for a long time is um, a collaborative organization that brings together chiropractors and acupuncturists and um, naturopaths as well as yoga therapists and Ayurvedic practitioners to look at, you know, here are different holistic sciences and how do we work together. So I think it is about all of the different ways that we can work together. And other challenges that have come up are, you know, every few years you hear a very prominent study that reveals the president's presence of um, heavy metals found in Ayurvedic formulas or in herbs um, purchased in Indian stores or in different kinds of settings. And, and the last time that happened, it was in the news pretty much everywhere, you know, that that was a great challenge. And I think that was something that in some ways set the community back a bit and in other ways was an opportunity for people to look at how to improve testing methodologies, how to look at formulas that are safe for large numbers of people, to look at how to fully use um, herbs that are organic or to support companies that are, are doing so in that way. So I think that there's an opportunity there. 
And I think one of the challenges, because one of the things that came up at that time was there is a tradition in Ayurveda of Rasa Shastra, right, of the alchemical preparation of different heavy metals. And not all of that is strictly legal in the U.S. So it is a challenge that not all of the real traditional Indian Ayurvedic practices can be practiced in the U.S. So how do we look at what can be practiced and what has a great deal of efficacy and how we can do so? But if we look at, say, Rasa Shastra, for example, it is... It, represents the types of remedies or formulations that you would not want to buy over the counter at any time or place. You would only use them, you would only use very powerful alchemical remedies that had um, very carefully processed minerals or heavy metals in them if you were to use them for very specific periods of time working with a vajja who is very closely monitoring you. It's kind of like in the world today, we would not go out and get surgery just for fun. I mean, I know there, there is a tradition in modern Western biomedicine of sort of people getting surgery for fun, but even that is not to be taken lightly, right? So when we think about, you know, the, the importation, the integration of yoga and Ayurveda, I think it's also important for us to remember that none of these are practices to be taken lightly. They are all far more powerful then sometimes we give them credit for. And I think that's why it is so important for people to be well trained and for people to, um, for people to work together with, say, their Western biomedicine practitioners or for practitioners um, to embrace the practices of yoga and Ayurveda. And I feel fortunate that, you know, in my, in my group of colleagues of Ayurvedic practitioners, of yoga therapists, there is a great deal of interest in how do we increase the professionalization and the professionalism. And in both the National Ayurvedic Medical Association and the International Association of Yoga Therapists, there are a lot of conversations in how much training does it take to be a yoga therapist or to be an Ayurvedic practitioner. And over the past couple of years, there has been a great effort to bring the community together to raise standards. And in the National Ayurvedic Medical Association, there was a printing of raising, raised standards this last year. There was a call to action for people who were trained at the level of practitioner to turn in and show you know, their, their training and to be able to register as practitioners. Um, there has been the announcement of um, accreditation for yoga therapy programs. So I think we see you know, the, the greater organization of these traditions can be seen as a challenge, but also can be seen as an opportunity to show these traditions, these sacred sciences in their best light and how they can best be part of the world today. Well, wasn't that wonderful?